glory forever. Amen. Jill's going to come and do a reading this morning um, from uh, part of Exodus chapter 19 and part of Exodus chapter 20. Maybe I've not changed the Bible there. Oh, yeah, that's fine. Um, if you're following along your own Bible, um, it's Exodus chapter 19, verses um, 16 to 25. So the last um, part of chapter 19. Then turn over the page towards the end of Exodus chapter 20, reading from verses 18 to the end there. Jill. Okay, thank you. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning, with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace. The whole mountain trembled violently and the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder. Then Moses spoke and the voice of God answered him. The Lord descended to the top of Mount Sinai and called Moses to the top of the mountain. So Moses went up and the Lord said to him, Go down and warn the people so they do not force their way through to see the Lord, and many of them perish. Even the priests who approach the Lord must consecrate themselves, or the Lord will break out against them. Moses said to the Lord, The people cannot come up Mount Sinai because you yourself warned us. Put limits around the mountain and set it apart as holy. The Lord replied, Go down and bring Aaron up with you. But the priests and the people must not force their way through to come up to the Lord, or he will break out against them. So Moses went down to the people and told them. When the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain in smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, Speak to us yourself and we will listen. But do not have God speak to us, or we will die. Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. God has come to test you, so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. The people remained at a distance while Moses approached the thick darkness where God was. Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell tell the Israelites this. You have seen for yourselves that I have spoken to you from heaven. Do not make any gods to be alongside me. Do not make for yourselves gods of silver or gods of gold. Make an altar of earth for me and sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, your sheep and goats and your cattle. Wherever I cause my name to be honored, I will come to you and bless you. If you make an altar of stones for me, do not build it with dressed stones for you will defile it if you use a tool on it. Amen. Thank you so much, Jill. As I said, these past uh, few weeks have been looking at the story of Moses and uh, how God's working in the life of Moses and the life of God's people as well. And we find ourselves um, a few chapters on from last week and um, from where we began with Moses, um, just at the first couple of chapters of um, Exodus, where we remember the, the famous story of Moses being put in the basket um, and sent down the River Nile because um, Pharaoh and uh, the people of Egypt um, no longer or don't want a rebellion um, when all of these little boys grow up and become soldiers, or at least strong men, um, and become potential soldiers. And so um, Pharaoh uh, sends or tries to kill all the the boys of Egypt, but Moses is rescued from that. And so we see Moses had a difficult background like many of us. Then we see that Moses um, is a sinner. He um, kills um, one of the Egyptian slave drivers out of anger. And we recognize that we are sinners as well, but yet God can still call us. Then we see that Moses was also felt inadequate, that he felt, I can't speak. I no longer, I cannot represent my people but God uses him nonetheless, and sometimes we feel inadequate. God, you could never do anything with me, but yet God can. 
And last week we saw how God worked miracles through Moses, that God can do great things when we trust in him and when we put him first. God sends his people through the Red Sea. And today we see a final thing in the life of Moses, that Moses becomes what's known as a mediator. But first, the context, we find ourselves now in chapters 19 and 20 at the foot of Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai is a famous scene in the Bible in the Old Testament for many encounters of God with his people. In fact, between the two passages that Jill read for us in 19 and 20, there's the Ten Commandments where we first see them being mentioned and Moses receives them and passes them on to God's people. And in these passages we saw Jill um, read, we see a few times Moses going from the people up to God, speaking to God, then coming back down and speaking to the people, and then doing this a few times. This takes place over just two or three days, and Moses goes up the mountain four times, three times in the same day. And this is no small hill like the, the walk up Kirkburn this morning, but this is an actual mountain, actually taller than Ben Nevis. And Moses was not a younger guy like myself, he was somebody in at least his 80s, walked up a mountain three times in the same day to meet with God. That's not today's um, sermon theme, walk up mountains three times to meet with God. If you want to do that, fine, but I don't, I'm not encouraging you to do that in the same day. But we do see Moses go up this mountain to speak with God, then come back down and does this numerous times. And the reason that Moses does this is because the people are scared they recognize that on this mountain is God himself, that they see God in all of his power and glory. We see it described, which we'll look at in a second, and they just cannot come close to that God. In verses 16 and 18 of chapter 19, it says the mountain was covered in thunder and lightning of a thick cloud. There's a huge trumpet blast representing God's presence. It's covered in smoke because the Lord descends upon it in fire and it trembles violently, almost like a big giant earthquake was taking place. So the people feel and see this magnitude of what God is like, and they want nothing to do with it. In verses 16 in chapter 19, they tremble. In chapter 20, they tremble with fear. They stay at a distance and say, Moses, you go, because if we come close, or even if we hear God speak, we will die. And they remain at a distance when Moses approaches. What's clear is as the people find themselves at the bottom of this mountain, there's an artist's depiction of it there. The people of God are down there in the valley, and that's perhaps Moses there on the left-hand side and the mountain of God in front of them. They are just captivated by this, and they want nothing to do with it because they're so petrified of God. They recognize God is most tangible, most present in creation at that point, and they are scared. They don't want to be anywhere near him. They recognize that if they were to be near him, their hearts might stop, that their bodies would melt in an instant. They tremble in fear and stay at a distance. They say, even if we hear God's voice, we might die. They have a problem. The God of heaven and earth, the only God who ever was or will be, the God who made the universe, the God who brought his people through the Red Sea, the God who today was calling them to be in a relationship with him, they cannot be anywhere close to him. They can't come close to him. They can't even hear his voice. So how will they know what to do? That relationship is doomed from a start. An unholy, holy, sinful people and a holy, righteous God cannot mix. R.C. Sproul said, a human dilemma is this. God is holy and we are not. God is righteous or perfect and we are not. And you and I have the exact same problem as the people of God at that time. There's a gap that no amount of engineering can ever bridge. The gap isn't over a raging sea. It's where the wind and the waves are going to pummel us. So the gap is that we are far from God. There's a huge chasm between the sinful humanity like me and like you and the holiness and the glory of God. Sometimes we might think or be tempted to think that the God of the Bible or the God of parts of the Bible is a different God for us today. That back then, in his younger days, God was much more powerful and a bit wacky and did all this amazing, powerful stuff. Today, he's like Santa Claus and just cuddly and nice. He doesn't care about what we do. He doesn't care about um, our lifestyles. He's just cuddly and nice, and he's love, love, love. Now, yes, he is love, and yes, he, he is nice, but also he's still just as powerful, just as holy, just as righteous and full of glory as he always was. If you don't believe me, turn to Revelation. It points to the future where we see God in all of his glory and his might, kicking the devil into hell, 
kicking all the evil in the world into hell. He is no weak, impotent, powerless God that sometimes we're tempted to turn him into. The same God of Exodus is the same God today. So how can we know this God if he is like the God that we see on the mountain of Mount Sinai? Well, we see Moses doing something to solve this issue. He's a go-between guy. He's a guy who speaks to God on the people's behalf, and he speaks to the people on God's behalf as well. He's the mediator. In that verse that I just read a minute ago, they say to Moses, you go ahead of us and speak to God, because if we hear his voice, we will die. And so we need a mediator for us today. We need someone to go between the two parties. If you're like me, then perhaps at some times you might feel that God is far off. There's a reason for that, and that is because, well, at times it seems like God is far off because he's different from us. He's transcendent beyond comprehension and our understanding. He's all-powerful, all-wise. He's uncreated. He exists outside of time and space. We're not all-powerful. We don't know everything. We exist in one time and in one place, and we are created. He is holy and exalted over all things. We are unholy. First Timothy says this of God. God is a blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who's immortal and who lives in unapproachable light. No one can see or has seen him. Israel got a taste of this God when they met him on the mountain or saw him on the mountain. They say to Moses, go and speak to God on our behalf. We think it'd be good if someone else went before us because if we come close, it's not going to be good for us. You kind of soften the blow for us. Think of it. How could we relate to such a God? Because we can't have this kind of God over for dinner or a sleepover. Certainly not at the moment anyway, um, with these current restrictions. How could we speak to such a God? You can't call him. He doesn't have an email address. How could you tell someone about a great being who always was, who always will be, whose greatness extends beyond time and space, i.e. the dimensions that we live in? If we can't ever understand him, how could we relate to him? How do little specks on earth talk to the God of heaven and earth? Because God's not fit into our bubbles, into our dimensions. We need someone to be that mediator. And also, as it says, or shows you there in the picture, a mediator is usually between two conflicting parties, two warring factions. Sometimes couples have been in programs like Jerry McKyle, and that's a great example of, well, I say great example, but it's an example of a mediator, someone who goes between the two warring factions. Or programs like Watchdog or Rip Off Britain, where the, somebody says, this company um, charged me a million pounds for something when they shouldn't have, they ripped me off. The programs go between them and say to the companies, fix this, and they solve the issue. These kind of things are what a mediator is, a go-between, somebody who stands in the gap between the two parties. And that happens with us as well. There's a rift, there's a chasm, there's a gap between us. We're friends of the world rather than with God. We have a sinful mind rather than obeying God. We chose evil behavior, Colossians says, over the goodness of God. And that separates us. It causes a chasm between us. Think of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. They sin, they mess up, they make mistakes before God, and they hide from him. God comes looking and says, where are you? And they are in hiding. Ever since, we've been doing the same, running far from God, wanting to stay apart from him, recognizing that we cannot be near him or like him any longer. We need a mediator, someone to bridge that gap. And I hope you believe that, because if you don't believe that, then you need to answer me this question. Why would Jesus come to earth if we didn't need a mediator? Why would God think it necessary to come in the form of a human being in, in Jesus Christ to live among us? Why would he empty himself of all of his grand power in the universe to come and live in our earth? Why would Christians celebrate the death of this person? Because if we don't need a mediator, if we don't need someone to stand in the gap, then someone needs to talk to God and phone him up today and say, God, you made a mistake. It was all pointless. We didn't need that at all. You made the wrong decision. But I don't think that's the case. I think we do need a mediator. The problem is Moses, as good as he was, was never going to be a perfect mediator. He was never going to be able to completely bridge that gap. Now, he did his best. He was a good chap. He loved God. He wanted to follow God and serve him and lead God's people. But he had one gigantic flaw. 
He, like you and I, had never lived a perfect day in his life, not even an hour or even a minute in his life. Like the best of us, he messed up, he sinned. So Moses cannot bridge that gap. In fact, the people of God still stand at distance even after Moses has walked back and forth. They stand far off as Moses goes in to um, meet with God. So yes, they can communicate somewhat with God. They can kind of have this go-between person, but they can never come face to face with him, at least not yet. But Moses knew there'd be a better mediator. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, he speaks of someone who is going to come, who would bridge that gap, who would make the way clear to God. And a long time later on, that prophecy came true when another child was born in spite of the government's efforts to kill him. And as a result of that mediator, we were able to gain access, not to the foot of the mountain, but to the throne room of God himself. Jesus is that mediator, the one who allows us and takes us into God's presence, who hears our prayers and presents them to God himself, who alone can usher us into the glory of heaven. We've been building walls against God since the Garden of Eden, but Jesus comes and knocks them down. Jesus appears in the scene. He's a mediator we all need, fully God and fully human. He's not like Moses where he's kind of quite nice and can get quite close to God. He's 100% God, but also 100% us. So he can bring God to us and we, he can bring humanity back to God. For over 30 years, he lived a life of perfection, never sinning, never once lying, cheating, stealing, being arrogant or boastful, never once having an inappropriate thought or lusting after someone. His life was fully and utterly committed to God. But in his 30s, Jesus was killed, falsely accused and tried and found guilty of trumped up charges, nailed to that wooden cross the death of a criminal. But his death was unlike any other. Because when he died, something different happened that never happened before or since. It says in the Gospels that the skies turned black when Jesus breathed his last. Dead folk who had been buried nearby rose to life. The temple in Jerusalem where he died was shaken and the curtain in that temple was torn in two. For hundreds, if not thousands of years, it had stood the test of time. It had been a huge, thick thing that had um, been opened and closed thousands of times. But in that moment, it tore in two. And that curtain was symbolic of how God was different from us, far away from us. He was behind the curtain and we could not get close to him. We were sinful, defiled and marred. God was perfect and holy and glorious. We could never get close to him. But in that moment, it tore right down the middle. And it was a megaphone call to the world, to you and to I today. Jesus died and God shouted from his megaphone. We once were separate, but Jesus has bridged the gap. Welcome home, my precious children. Welcome back into my presence with freedom and with joy. No longer do we need to be fearful or far from God, but we come boldly into his presence today. If you're, in G if you're in Christ, if you know Jesus as your saviour, here's the good news for you. Where once you were an enemy of God, whether you knew it or not, you were an enemy of God. Now you are a child of God. It says that we're adopted and precious in God's sight when we trust in Jesus. The Lord is for us and no longer against us. But there might be some of us here today or listening along who recognise, I've never done this, Andrew. I've never trusted in Jesus. I know Jesus, I know about God, but I've never actually given my sins to him then I want you to hear this loud and clear. You should fear God. Because your sins aren't forgiven, but you're still in desperate need of a saviour, a mediator. Someone who can take the sins from you and give them to Jesus instead. Someone who can rip them apart from you and plunge them into the depths of the sea. We all need this saviour. We all need Jesus. So if you've never yet trusted in him, when are you going to do it? When are you going to find freedom and joy and forgiveness and hope forevermore? Romans 5 says that since we've been justified by faith, we have peace at last through Jesus Christ. In Ephesians chapter 3, this verse here, because of Christ and our faith in him, we can now come boldly and confidently into God's presence. Unlike the people of God back then, they were fearful and trembling. They recognized they could never bridge that gap. They were awaiting the one who could. So today, you and I are invited into God's presence, not a far away, scary, distant God, but one who's close and personal. He's not an aloof, disappointed headmaster 
type figure that maybe some of us remember from our school days where we never wanted to be anywhere near. But instead, he's like a lo- loving parent who lavishly loves us, who's generously affectionate and supreme, supremely gracious, and who cherishes us. Some of us need assurance that actually we're saved, but not lost. Well, remember that Jesus has died for you, and that simple faith is all that you need. You don't have to work hard. You don't have to do anything. You have to trust that Jesus has taken your place. And if you have trusted in him, then know that he is your rock and a savior and a hope today. And that when you breathe your last on this earth, as one day you will, you will hear your loving heavenly father in the very next breath say to you, welcome home, good and faithful servant. Today you'll be with me in paradise. Is it because you're good and you went to church or you gave money to charity? None of those things. It's because you trusted in Jesus, the one who walks up the mountain, who walks into God's throne room and takes us there on our behalf. These last five weeks were never about Moses. They were always about our God who is great and glorious, who chooses people like you and like me, regardless of our background or our circumstances or our sin or our ability or lack of faith even. Just like Moses who had all of these things and often like you and me. It's about a God who works through us to cause great things to happen, who changes and transforms society. Last night, Kirsty and I were watching um, the well-known film, 12 Years a Slave, um, about slavery and all that went on um, in the days um, of the slavery and the slave trade. But that ended because Christians, by and large, stood up and said, that is not right. Christians and people who love Jesus can transform and do continue to transform the world when we trust in him. It's about a God who, though he is holy and to be greatly feared, has made a way so that we can be reunited with him. So don't fear, don't tremble, but come to God today, our hope and our saviour, not through our own works or our own merit, but through trusting in Jesus, for he takes us to God. He is the way, the only way to God. Let's pray. Gracious and everlasting God, it's awesome when we read these verses of Scripture and we see just how different you are from us. You are glorious and perfect and holy and righteous, and so often we are anything but those things. But yet you do not keep us far from your presence. You call us into it. You call us to find our joy and our freedom and our hope in you. To find that there is a loving, lavishly loving Father who cares about us, who is for us, who is with us, who wants to show us grace upon grace upon grace. So help us today to trust in you, to know that through Jesus we find this forgiveness. We are ushered into your presence and into the throne room of heaven. Help us today to know your love in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to praise God again in in song, and um, we're going to sing or uh, watch or read the words of Beautiful Saviour, hymn number 467. Um, The first two verses, um, we will um, listen along and watch along, and in verse 3 and that chorus, um, we will stand and say them together. So the first two verses and choruses will remain seated third verse and chorus will stand up and say together.
to dwell where the glory never fades, where countless worshippers share one song, and cries of the worthy will honour the Lamb. Beautiful Saviour, wonderful Counselor, clothed in majesty, Lord of history, you're the way, the truth, the life, star of the morning, glorious in holiness, you're the risen one, heaven's champion, and you reign, you reign over all. Please take a seat. Let's unite our hearts in prayer once more. Father, we've just been thinking about, contemplating on how we have this great mediator, the one who stands in the gap between us and you, who clears the way, who clears the path so that we can come close to you can find ourselves face to face, not in fear, but full of awe and full of love. For you are the only God, and there is only one true mediator who stands between ourselves, a sinful people, and you, the awesome holy God, who takes our place, who speaks on our behalf, who pleads before the God who judges hearts of people, the mediator who served a sentence for our sin. Lord, because we have this mediator, we come to you with all of our prayers for others and ourselves, our prayers for a world around us that is broken and needing your love and your grace poured out upon our friends and family members and ourselves who perhaps are struggling with various things. So Lord, we bring before you those known to us today who are ill, who or finding life tough for one reason or another. I think if there's known to us who are in hospital or undergoing treatment, perhaps suffering and struggling many years still after a diagnosis, Lord, we ask you to comfort those who are dying, those who have been bereaved recently, those who are uncertain of the future and finding that there is no hope in their lives. May you be so close to them. Pour out your grace your mercy and your love upon them. And Lord, may you use us as your people, as the people who claim to know and to love you, the God of love and grace. Help us to be your hands and your feet so that when someone is crying and mourning and struggling, help us to love them in tangible, effective, practical ways, to give them texts and phone calls cards and flowers, to offer to cook them food, to, when we're allowed to, wrap our arms around them. Lord, help us to be your people, to be people who bring the kingdom of God more tangibly, more um, openly into the sight of those around us. Lord, we pray too for our government as it continues to work out its way ahead through all of the mess of COVID. We pray for protection for people up in Dennis land, for wisdom for our leaders. I pray for businesses at the end of, um, perhaps at the end of their time. Lord, may you be with the business owners. Help them to find a way through all this. Help them to find the support that they need and for their staff as well. Lord, we are grateful and thankful that this part of Scotland, this part of our world has not been as badly affected. But Lord, help us not be complacent but help us to be wise and generous and kind to others. Even when we're all stressed out and anxious and worried and, and just bored out of our minds, not being able to hang out with family and friends in the ways we once were used to. 
Help us to be people of peace, people of kindness, people of mercy. So, Lord, may you in all your glory and all your majesty be with us. Help us to be your people. We pray all of these things and the prayers on our hearts and minds today. In the name of Jesus Christ, the one who goes before us, who brings us to God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our closing um, worship, our closing song this morning is hymn number 458, At the Name of Jesus. Um, There are four verses to this hymn. On the fourth one, uh, we will stand and say it together as we close our time together. So, At the Name of Jesus, hymn number 458. In his Father's glory, Christ shall come again, angel host proclaiming his return to reign. For all wreaths of empire meet upon his brow, and our hearts confess him, King of glory now. And so may the blessing and the presence of his King of glory go with you and all who you love, today and forevermore. Amen. of the Lord be with you be with you now may the peace of the Lord be with you be with you now and all
and may God's face shine 